So, the folks at Blender Foundation have just announced Blender 4.4, the beta, and this simply means that you can go ahead, grab it, and start playing with it. And for creators and artists that would like to use Blender 4.4 in future projects or build for it, this is the right time for you to test it for bugs and report them. And for those who like to get this, all you need to do is go over to blender.org, click on the download button, and go right down to where you find Download Blender Experimental. And right there, you'll notice that Blender 4.4 the beta is available, and Blender 4.5 just hopped into alpha. And for Blender 4.5, which is going to be an LTS, there is literally nothing new here. The only place you get to find anything new is within the 3D viewport that exists under the user interface section. And Blender 4.5 will continually be in alpha till June the 4th of 2025. And Blender 4.4, which is currently in beta, will continually be in beta till the 12th of March 2025 when the pre-release of Blender 4.4 is scheduled. And Blender 4.4 will be finally released on the 18th of March 2025. Now before we get right into it, it is worth mentioning that there's a couple of things that are scheduled for 2025 which might give you an idea where the folks at Blender Foundation wants to take Blender this year. So last year we did see the extension platform, the GPU compositor, EV Next, Grease Pencil 3rd generation and the brush asset system all made their way to Blender. The future of animation aka Baklava is still doing some interesting warm-ups and hopefully we'll get to see all of it in 2025. Now for 2025, they started off with the winter of quality project which is aimed at stability and documentation of all areas of Blender so they can simply shift focus to start and finish brand new projects. And there's a couple of projects that are proposed for this year. And these projects are within these following areas, which include the node systems, the production tools, sculpting, performance, story tools, and some ongoing projects which we're going to take a look at now. And this ongoing project includes the rendering that deals with Cycle and NPR, something I've talked about on the channel before, Vulkan, the UV syncing and other improvements, HDR support in all editors, layered animation which brings us to Baklava and other animation improvements. There's also ongoing maintenance and development within the USD and game interoperability via GLTF. Blender 5.0 backward incompatibility changes is also something that's currently worked on and there are a few other modules. And these are some of the things that might be happening in 2025. There's a couple of releases planned for the year. 4.4 is around the corner, 4.5 the LTS will be coming out in July, and 5.0 will be kicked off sometime in November, and Blender 3.6 the LTS will come full circle sometime in June of 2025. And these are some of the potential projects and stuff that we should be expecting for Blender in 2025. And for those who like to download Blender 4.4 the beta, this is currently available for both Windows, Mac and Linux. And with that said, let's dive right into Blender 4.4 and see some of the cool updates that are now here. So with Blender 4.4 the beta open right here, you would notice that we have an amazing splat screen and of course a huge shout out to the creators of Flow. This is an amazing show. For those who haven't seen the movie, please go ahead and check it out. This movie has put Blender on the map and has shown that with the tools currently available in Blender, you can create feature length movies that can win international and industry standard awards. And for a show that has put Blender on the map this much, it is deserving to be the splat screen of Blender 4.4. So with this here, if we simply dive right into Blender 4.4, you would notice that the UI looks pretty similar to Blender 4.3 but there's a couple of nice little updates here and there. And while we speak about the viewport and the splitting, if you're working with smaller areas, for example the timeline, this automatically makes the scroll bar disappear. So this is one of the things to keep in mind if you're splitting areas within Blender. Smaller regions with scroll bar would quietly disappear to make more room for you to be able to see what exactly you're dealing with. Now if you take a look at the status bar, there's a couple of interesting updates right there. The status bar now shows warning when an active object has a non-uniform or negative scale. It also shows warning when the transform operator has no effect on a model. There's also a couple of interesting updates and improvements to the status bar which includes the display for mesh point normals, UV stitching, grease pencil lines, annotation drawing and a lot more. And generally the status bar looks pretty cool as the status bar notification banner are now truncated when very long. Something else which is interesting to see is this, that if we simply go over to our asset browser, you would now notice that the asset browser is well arranged. So by default, if you're working with the asset browser, say with Blender 4.3 or lower, you would notice that the asset browser just simply mixes things up because it goes alphabetically. So what happens is if you go over to your previous versions of Blender, say Blender 4.3, you only have access to clicking on this button and changing the size and everything stays alphabetically, which gives a slightly not so nice combination once you're within your asset browser and you've not selected a specific catalog. But with Blender 4.4, if you simply click right here, 
you'll be able to change the size, sort this by name, and asset catalog. And this is going to sort the asset catalog hierarchically. Something interesting that is also here for the asset browser is this. That by default, if we simply create an asset, say for example, we do create this asset, have this cube, go right here, right click, mark this as an asset and have it as an asset. If we tap in on the keyboard, you now notice that we've got a preview. This preview can now be removed. So if you do have custom images for your asset, you can now simply click on the load button and load those custom images in. And of course, you can always click and re-render the active object as the asset image or asset preview image that you want. And for the 3D viewport, there's a couple of interesting updates. One of them is this, that if you simply go over to the overlay and you turn on face orientation, you would notice that what we have is just the red. So in previous versions of Blender, you get to see blue and red to tell us where the normals are and if they've been flipped. And for Blender 4.4, we do have these red showing us that the face normal has been flipped. And to fix this is very simple. As if we jump over to the edit, we can simply have them selected, go over to mesh, go down to normal, and then we can flip the normal. And while we're speaking about edit, if you simply have any object selected and you go within the edit mode, you can now have access to the indices. So by default, this is not turned on if you're working with previous versions of Blender. So with Blender 4.3 open right here, how you do access this is by simply going over to edit, go over to preference, and then turn on the developer extra setting. Now, if you don't do this, you may not be able to have access to it because if we jump over to this, and I have them selected and go right here, we now have it. If I choose to go ahead and turn this off, and let's say we just go ahead and save that, click on this one more time, you notice it's gone. However, if you have the object selected, because you've turned this on previously, it is still available. And this seemed to be like a very tiny bug that had been there, and the folks at Blender have just fixed it. So now you no longer need to go over to edit, go over to preference, turn this on, no, it is no longer necessary and you can always turn on the indices and work with it. And some of you guys might be asking, so what exactly is this? This is very similar to what you have with Houdini. However, in Houdini, this is sort of called as face point. This brings Blender one step to procedural modeling and if geometry node can include the idea of group selection or even face point selection, or should I call it indices selection within the geometry node is definitely gonna make procedural modeling easier because the current way of doing the whole selection thing takes a long time. Houdini just makes it super easy for you to do that. Face number points definitely makes this super easy to access and work with, especially when you can combine them with groups and create interesting looking stuff. Anytime you have objects selected and you hide them, you now have a tiny notification within the status bar that informs you about the number of objects you have hidden. This is going to be useful if you have large scenes and you like to hide multiple objects. Another interesting update here is locking the viewport. So originally, we did see that if you have your camera selected, you can now simply hit this button and lock the camera to view. That was pretty interesting to see come over to Blender. However, if you jump out of the view, and you like to lock your viewport to a specific view. Say for example, you've got multiple views, possibly you like your camera to look at stuff from here and you like to make some additional changes from a direction like so, you can now easily start doing that. So all you need to do is to tap in on the keyboard, go over to where you have view and you can now lock rotation. And this rotation is going to lock the view from rotating. So at this point, you can only zoom in and out, but you cannot orbit across your 3D viewport. If you uncheck this, this becomes possible, but if you check it, then this simply locks. Something else which is really cool is being able to disable your collections within your viewport. So right here, we've got our first collection and we have a second collection. So if you simply go over to the collection section, you can select any of these collections and disable them within the viewport. Already disabling within render, handout, indirect only and selectable is something that's always been there. As for example, if we have selectable turned off, we can't select any of these. Of course, we can select these ones and we can select any of these ones if we turn it on. Of course, you can do that. And for the visibility within the viewport, you can now disable that and you can also select any of these other collections and disable them as well. So if you have a large scene and there are certain assets you like to have visible within your scene, but then you don't want them to be selectable or possibly you want to have them in a collection, which you can turn on and turn off at any point in time, then this would come in super handy. Of course, there are other interesting updates for the 3D viewport. One of them includes that you can now play animation while in sculpt mode, which is something that I think has already existed in Blender for some time now. 
The viewport render animation now shows the progress bar, object data name shows shown in text overlay, and cavity properties are now in a separate panel in the viewport shading. And since speaking about the interface, the UV editor now has a Ctrl C and Ctrl V shortcut for copying and pasting UVs. You can now set a selected outline color for pull downs. A warning message is shown when drag and drop of image simply fails. And in terms of preview, preview images now load faster and displays with less artifacts in different sizes. And the eyedropper color picking operation can now be cancelled without losing the original color. And generally, menu accelerators now work with toggles. And toggling on any of these menu accelerators, you can simply hit on the corresponding underlined letter on your keyboard and turn this on or off. There's a couple of updates within the properties editor and within the preference, there is also a couple of interesting updates that you may want to consider checking out. At the same time, there's some interesting updates for tooltips. And if you work with both Mac and Windows, the OS title bar now uses the theme color. There's an interesting update to how you view files in Mac OS, which is pretty impressive. Say for example, there's a specific Blender file you like to see. Once you have that selected and you press the spacebar within your finder, this automatically pops up spotlight and you'll be able to see the thumbnail and the description of the specific file that you just previewed. And for those working with Windows, if you like to do this, then there is a tool that you can actually get. This tool is for free and you can go over to the Windows Store or go over to GitHub. I'm going to put links in the description and this is called Quick Look. So by default, this can allow you view text, video files, documents, PDF, and so on. And it's quite interesting to see that if you simply go over to your Blender and register Blender 4.4 as your default version of Blender, if you select your Blender file and press your spacebar, you'll also be able to pop up the quick look, which is an alternative to Max Spotlight. And you can use this to have a quick look of your Blender file, see the name, the data size, and also when it was last modified. Blender 4.4 within the Sculpting, Painting and Texturing section has a few updates. One of them has to do with a new brush type, which is the Plane Brush, and is a generalization of the existing Flatten, Fill and Scrape Brush types. The Clothe Brushes now have the persistent options of by default, and if you work with a Grab Random Clothe and Grab Brush, this now uses the Local Simulation area by default when using them on your model. And also within the Sculpting, Painting and Texturing section, Blender 4.4 also comes with some Kratos update and a simple key map update. And for Cycles, there's some interesting updates, as the updated NVIDIA Optics Denoiser type now brings a more improved denoising quality to Cycles overall. And this improvement in denoising quality can manifest as a more consistent denoising, more accurate colors, better retention of details, and less denoising blotches. And for EV and the viewport, there's a couple of interesting updates which deals with the overlays, as the overlays have been written for better constants and better extendability. Vulcan Experimental Backend now receives a big update in performance, stability, and compatibility, as the backend is still considered experimental, just like we saw with Blender 4.3. And due to some missing features like the OpenXR, OpenSubdiv, and Hydra viewport, this is still left as experimental. And for those who like to see some performance and compatibility, then you can come through and check them out. And just like we mentioned in the beginning of the video, most of the sections of Blender are dealing with quality of life improvement and tiny updates, and modeling and UV testifies to it. The same thing can also be said for Grease Pencil, however, Grease Pencil has added a few things that were missing in 4.3 and some features have been placed back from 4.2. And for those considering to use animated volumes created procedurally in geometry nodes when working with USD, this is now fully supported. So for pipeline, asset, and IO, you now have some nice looking updates for both USD and GLTF. And this includes updates to the importer and also exporter. There are updates and breaking changes for the Python API and text editors. And if you work with the video sequence editor, there are some nice stuff here. As text strips can now be edited directly in preview area, and you can simply jump into that and out by simply pressing the tab key just like you would do when you're editing a mesh. Text strips with wall draft or multiple line text can now properly do left, center and right alignment within each line. The background of the text script can now be filled and you can simply round the edges if you want. There's some nice looking updates to the entire UI as you can collapse several parts of the menu as you can collapse several parts of the menu. In terms of performance, building proxies for image sequences is now faster, preview playback performance of float HDR content is also faster, videos can now be rendered using H264-HEV codec. 10 to 12 bit channel videos are now supported alongside a list of other updates that are now available for the video sequence editor. 
And speaking about the video sequence editor, this compositor now supports an integer socket. So you can now connect integer sockets and do the most. Some things have been changed and this includes that transformations are now delayed until it is necessary to apply them. So scaling down an image or even scaling it up again will no longer pixelate that image. That is, transformations are no longer destructive until the image is actually processed. The wrapping option in the translate node was turned into the repeat option that infinitely repeats when mixed with a larger image. The glare node was revamped and this is to provide a better user experience and a more flexible control. As the node options are now single value inputs that can be linked, there's also a new strength input that now controls the strength and can boost the glare's power. So if you like to increase the power of the glare, you can actually crank this up depending on what you want to achieve. There's also the fog glow size, which is now linear. And this is relative to the image size that you're currently working on. The bloom size, just like the fog glow size, is also linear and relative to the image size. Geometry node also has a bit of an update to certain nodes. Like for example, the subdivision surface node now has the limit surface option, which originally exists as an option from the modifier. So if you're one of the creators that have been looking for this, there you go. The normal input node now output proper face corner normals instead of just the face normals. Collections and object input node has also been added. And how this works is very simple. We've got a cube and a geometry node, and we do have two different collections. And this is quite similar to what we have with Blender 4.3. The only difference is there's a collection input node which allows you to actually select the collection. Every other thing is pretty similar. For example, if you like to distribute on a specific mesh, connect the collection to the collection info, and then you need to throw in an instance on point, and then instance the collection to that point. Normally, just like we have with Blender 4.3, you can turn on reset children and separate children to bring that distribution right where you want it to be. And when you turn on the peak instance, this is going to distribute only to the specific point. Blender 4.4 animation rigging section comes with a few things, which deals with the slotted actions, pose library, rigging, graph editor, and constraint. And so for slotted action, what this means is simple. This is a structure of various actions which allows you to store the animation of multiple things in one action. We're possibly going to make a full detailed video about this one just to show you guys how you can work with it. Alongside this, there's some updates to the Python API and there's also update to the pose library as the pose library has been updated to enable smoother workflow when working with the pose asset. The pose no longer needs to be set as the current action and the pose asset can now be created to an asset library that is not in the current file. At the same time, the pose asset can now be easily deleted and pose assets can store the data for more than one amateur using slots. And for the pose library, there's also some operators which you might possibly want to consider taking a look at, which deals with how you can create pose asset, modify this pose asset, delete the pose asset and get going with it. And for rigging, bone collection memberships is now mirrored when symmetrizing an amateur. For graph editor, there's a single update and there's also a single update for constraints as well, which deals with relationship lines for constraints. These and more are now available with Blender 4.4, the beta. So for those who like to take a look at any of these, possibly you like to check them out, see some of the compatibility stuff and check out some of the breaking changes for both Python API, the upgraded libraries to match with the VFX platform of 2025, then links to all of these are going to be in the description. So do well to check them out. And of course, a huge shout out to the folks at Blender Foundation for making this possible. Tell me what you guys think about this one in the comment section. And of course, if you like this video or you learned something from this, you can go ahead and give a like and don't forget to share with a friend. And if you're new here, it's going to be amazing for you to hit the subscribe button and also turn on the notification so that you don't miss the next video or the next update. And until I see you guys in the next one, peace.